everyone, and welcome to episode 347 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host, Mark. Now, today, I think this guest is a huge deal. I've been a fan of his songwriting, his performing, his music for well over 20 years. My love first started with this guy when I used to be a huge fan of Million Dead, one of the best British bands for me of all time, and then his solo career as Frank Turner. My God, the guy is one of the best songwriters in the country, just an absolute workhorse, so I'm thrilled to announce that on today's episode, I'm joined by, obviously, Frank Turner. Now, this interview is huge for me because, like I said, I'm a massive fan, but also... I didn't realise how far back our history goes. I actually bought a t-shirt off Frank Turner over 20 years ago at a Reuben gig. And I just thought to myself today, like, why has this interview not happened until now? Like, there's been opportunities with all his albums, his touring, but it just came at the right time. And it is to promote his brand new album, which is called Undefeated and is out now. I say this almost on every episode, but truly... His brand new album is, for me, some of his best work. I absolutely love it. And as it's right now May, I'm going to say it's my album of the year. The lyrics are absolutely gorgeous in every single way. And he's just amazing. And the best news is, is I'm going to give you the interview right now. So here's me and Frank Turner talking all things music. Frank, thanks for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. Uh, thank you very much for having me. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. I'm very good. Uh, what I do with every guest that comes on, it doesn't matter what path you've been on or what walk of life you've been on, is take it right back to the start. Um, sure. Especially with musicians and bands. I, I know you might get this question a lot, but I love to know the first album you bought with your pocket money or was given that made you basically fall in love with music. Um, I mean, for me, it was a record uh, called Killers by Iron Maiden. Amazing. Um, my my folks, I was about 10 years old. My folks listen to, and indeed, my mum plays music, but it's classical music and church music, and they don't really, don't really believe in drum kits and electrification and stuff like that. And um, I was about 10, and I, I saw an Iron Maiden poster, and I thought it was cool, and I told my dad about it, and he got me a cassette from the R Price at Waterloo Station. Oh, our Price. Place. Uh, record stores at, at train stations um, and uh, yeah and it changed my life you know just it was like very much a kind of light switch moment for me. And then it all changed for I think we're the same age I'm 42. Yes 42. Yeah, yeah. so one of my first ever gigs was Green Day at the Wolverhampton Wolfram Hall. Oh, um, Wolfram, lovely. What a great place but to see Green Day on the Dookie tour I think it was it was mind-blowing and I was wondering what your introduction to live music was because I think it stays with you forever doesn't it that first show? It does. I mean, I, so, um, is it embarrassing? When, yeah, no, well, no, no, it's just, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of sidebar here. Essentially. So my mum uh, was sort of horrified by my newfound interest in metal. Not least I brought home a copy of, I think it was Kerrang magazine that had a feature on cannibal corpse in it. Wow. And she was just like, no. Um, so I, I was sort of banned from buying music magazines, listening to records, going to shows, all that kind of stuff. I did that all sort of in secret as it were not it, it felt like forever at the time but sort of when i do the maths on it it was probably for about a year or <laughs> you know what i mean but um you know my 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 um my time of oppression man anyway um uh but my mum my was very opposed to me going to shows for a long time and i think that she thought that shows were you know bikers injecting each other with heroin satan worshiping yeah yeah, do you know what I mean? Um, and I have been to gigs like that, actually. So, uh, but uh, so there was a band. My my mum had a friend whose son was in a band called Snug. I don't know if you remember Snug. I remember the name, but I don't remember. Mm. I can't picture them or hear them they, in my head. They were a sort of sort of kind of. I mean, I don't mean to be rude to them because I enjoyed their music, but they were a sort of like Ash kind of territory band. You know, yep. a symposium that sort of scene of kind of. Uh, power pop pop punk yeah but not the not the californian version of that anyway they were playing at the joiners arms in southampton which was down the way and because my mum's friend's son was the singer in this band 
my mum could sort of see a way to allowing me to go to this show. So um, off I went with a couple of friends. And my memory is that uh, my memory is it was great and perfect in every way. And we um, I seem to remember that we pogoed all the way through the support bands and the between bands music. That's incredible. <laughs> Probably to the vast annoyance of everybody around us. But um, yeah, it was it was a life changing event. I've followed your career from, I think it's over 20 years. I remember being at uni and I saw you in Leicester at the Charlotte. And I think I mentioned just before we hit record today with Million Dead, I believe the scene was absolutely untouchable back then. You had Hell is for Heroes, 100 Reasons, Million Dead, Ruben, Biffy Clyro. Um, um, McCluskey as the one. I unbelievable. Know. Just cave yeah. in all these incredible bands that came through. Um, does it seem an absolute lifetime ago that you were involved in <laughs> such a great scene? Because I have, for me, it's university days. It feels like it was only 10 years ago, but then someone remind me it's 25 years since this yeah. album came out. And I'm like, yeah. fuck off. You know? No, I know what you mean. It is like time relentlessly marches forward. Oh, um, God. It does feel like a different lifetime in many ways. And like, um, I mean, one, one of the things, again, talking about the kind of telescoping nature of time is that like, um for example i was in, i was briefly uh in a band called knee joke before as a million dead and those two events feel separated very separate in my head or at least they did until kind of just the other day i realized that they were like two years apart from each other and the whole thing's now 20 years ago and that they they're much more of a piece than anything to do with my life now if yeah. you see what I mean. and it's like Oh, okay. That's weird. You know, like, um, I mean, you know, it, it was, a, it was an interesting time. It was a slightly strange time in the sense that there, there sort of was a community of, in the bands and there wasn't, you know, um, I've stayed friends with the Biffy guys since then for sure. Um, and, uh, I, st I was chatting with Jamie Lemon just the other day, actually, funnily enough. Um, but it, but it's like, there was, there, it was, it was an odd moment, like Million Dead, I was listening back to Millionaire the other day. Me and um, Ben, the drummer, are still friends, and we got pissed, and <laughs> our wife kind of left us to it as we reminisced. And listening back at the time, as much as we liked bands like Funeral for a Friend, Hell is for Heroes, and A Hundred Reasons, that particular sort of triumvirate, like we liked those people and we respected their music and liked their music, but we didn't feel like we had anything in common with them musically at all in terms of our influences or our intentions. And um, and, and again, there's no part of me that's denigrating those bands and saying no. that. It sort of felt like we were just trying to do slightly di pretty different things, actually. And, and, and there, was, there have been times when I wonder whether that sentiment, it was kind of youthful braggadocio and that actually we were. But actually listening back to Million Dead the other day, I was like, nah, man, we were fucking weird. Do you know what I mean? Like, we were a strange band. I'm not saying we were the best band by any stretch of the imagination, but we were quite odd. We didn't really fit with that. Um, we didn't have the kind of power chord choruses do you know what no, I mean? that's fair like, and um and we were we were kind of chasing like hot snakes and fugazi and of course at the drive-in let's not that's forget. the band that always comes to my head is at the drive-in i kind yeah, of feel the same riffs and the same power tones and the yeah, guitar tones yeah but it's like i mean i think one of our kind of secret weapons cameron our guitarist was much more interested in stuff like d4 and um that kind of slightly scuzzy rock and roll sort of yeah. thing um, which in fairness at the time I wasn't that into, but, um, it sort of put, it gives what we did sort of this, this just slightly left field flavor. So, um, but I mean, you know, obviously many, many more people care about, um, most of the other bands in that scene <laughs> cared about Million Dead. So maybe it was to our detriment. With everything at the moment, there seems to be, uh, anniversary shows for albums and there's a lot mm. of bands doing 20th anniversaries. Would you ever pick up the mic for Million Dead and do it again? Because I feel like it's so past where you are now and so different. Sure. I, I don't know if you'd feel like I can't get in the mindset for these songs anymore. I can't do it. Yeah, it's well. As, to be honest, the challenge would be as much physical in the sense that I was <laughs> right at the top of my range back then, and I I cannot hit some of the notes uh, that I sang in Million Dead. We'd have to detune some guitars pretty heavily. But for the longest time, my answer to that question has been fuck no. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? like straight up, fuck no, never, never going to happen. And I'm not saying it is going to happen, but I did sort of when I was hanging out with Ben the other day. It was sort of nice to realise that the things that any of us were fucked off with each other about are now so far in the past that it's almost laughable. Do you know what I mean? I just can't quite remember what it was I was annoyed about. <laughs> isn't that isn't that lovely though? Isn't it that it's I may may have taken two decades and now lots of drinks to realise and kind of <laughs> life goes on. But 
all those issues, even for me, then I wasn't in bands that were successful. We did a few shows at the Charlotte and stuff, but the problems that were between us now just aren't important. They really aren't. Yeah. And it's, it is a, a lovely thing. Yeah. It's that sort of realization that, I mean, the insert cliche here, but like time heals wounds and yeah, and just, just stuff kind of, it doesn't matter. And it, like after a certain amount of time, um, I mean, you know, it's not, uh, something that's on my immediate to-do list. I think this is the other thing about it that would be slightly weird is in it, perhaps in a good way is that like, um, and I want to say this with, with all the due respect for anybody else who might be tangential to this conversation, but like, I don't need to do it no. myself because what I do as a, as a solo artist has been more successful than in dev was, which means that my motivation to do it would be purely musical and artistic rather than like, Christ, I need a fucking payday. The mortgage is course, ever. Yeah. And, and I actually quite like that fact. Do you know what I mean? It means that if it were ever to happen, it would be for the right reasons. Not again, that I'm trying to cut. No, I've, out. I've, I've been in the crowd to many reunion shows and you can see there's somebody got a legal or tax bill and you think, it's transparent. I've been to shows where I've just gone, these guys are just going through the motions. You can see they're not even sure. talking. And it's like, yeah. I'd rather you just have left it as it was. Totally. The, the flip side of that for me, and like, but then this brings up another thing. Like, so, um, I mean, my hardcore kind of like Trump card is that I saw Refused in 98. Yeah. Um, but I also saw the, the first round of reunion shows they did. And I was like, you know what? Hats off to you guys. You changed the genre. You broke up. You didn't get any of the kind of credit. You didn't get your victory lap. And you kind of deserve one. And I was happy for them to kind of like, yeah. you know, do that. And then they announced they were doing a new album. And I was like, no, what? And, yeah. and like, I haven't personally been a huge fan of, of the new material that they've done. But, you know, I didn't resent them that initial reunion tour. I was like, fuck it, man. No, I was there. I saw them in Birmingham on that tour. And Dennis was like, like I remember him back in the day. And he was still swinging the mic and singing. And yeah. they had the and energy. They, and they, were, they, were, they were transcendent. They were, they were amazing. And, and sort of claiming their crown in a way that they felt yeah. they were. Excited. So I mentioned that. I mean, you know, like I saw the other day, like hundreds of reasons going out and kind of doing Brixton again. And I just thought it was so cool because so slight tangent here, but like, um, every single person in the band at some point, particularly when their career is sort of on the, on the upslope kind of gives the interview where they go, I mean, you know, the success isn't all that important to me and I'd keep doing it regardless. And, and it's just like, I call bullshit on that statement of course. because it's really easy to say when everything's still kind of going well and increasing in size and all the rest of it. And it's like, would you really go back to playing the Barfly after you've headlined Brixton Academy? And here's the thing, hundred reasons did. Yeah, they they I saw them at the Barfly seven years after they'd headlined Brixton, and then they went back and headlined Brixton again. And fucking hats off to that, you know. I think that's I think they've earned the right to kind of slightly strut about that. Do you know what I mean? They they really did it, and and I think that's um, admirable. I love the fact that now we're sitting here and we're on the verge of you releasing album number ten. That blows my <laughs> mind. It does. It must se never seem like that, but. I know it's sure. hard to kind of have this huge trip down memory lane today, but did you ever think when you started that solo career and those ideas of putting pen to paper and thinking, I'm going to go under my own name, you'd be sat here doing album number 10 with all the success of touring the world and being where you are? <laughs> or did you just throw your hat into the mix and think, I'll see what happens? Um, I think, I mean, I'd be, it would be insane to say that I expected it and... and... I mean, it's sort of an odd thing to say, but like, you know, of course, I mean, did I, did I sort of secretly hope and dream that it might go well, whatever that might look like? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, I, I had ambitions to continue being a musician yeah. over, over time. I mean, um, you know, I, at the same time, I mean, the, the funny thing about that particular moment in my life, the, the sort of transitional moment from, from, um, million dead to, to, to the solo thing is that, um, at the time, I, I just sort of, I just sort of felt I knew what I was doing, and in this way that feels quite sort of uh, artistically integral. I was just like, I have these songs, I'm going to play these songs. Loads of people I knew thought I was having some kind of psychotic episode. They're not claiming any sort of enormous precedence here, but like the path from a punk or hardcore or post-hardcore band to making solo acoustic music was 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 much less clear yeah. at that point in, in music history. You know, Jonah Matranga existed, Chuck Reagan and Tim Barry were starting to put out records, but there was a moment later where it was sort of became the thing that some, the singer would from any given band would do a solo record or whatever. 
And so, you know, I remember telling people, oh, I'm going to do folk music or, or my version of folk music. And people were just like, are you okay? Like, <laughs> do you um, need to see a doctor? <clears throat> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do you want to talk to someone kind of thing? And like, um, so everyone thought I was nuts and I thought I had a plan. And the funny thing is that now looking back, everybody thinks I must have had a plan. And I kind of think I must have been slightly nuts because I sort of find it quite difficult to, to think my way back into that mindset. But there was a certain kind of like sort of sleepwalkerness to it. Do you know what I mean? It was just kind of like, uh, I mean, and the part of that was because I was really gutted when Melinda broke up and I just was sort of wanted to keep going. I mean, ironically, uh, about six months before Melinda broke up, I moved out of the shared house I was living in in Finchley Park and like sold all my shit and was like, I'm just going to be on tour forever. And that's when I went out and did crewing for Ruben is because Million Dead didn't tour enough to sustain that. Um, so I was working, going out with other bands and stuff and then many that broke up and it was like, fuck, yeah. um, you know, and, and it's quite easy to, to book solo shows. And at the beginning my fee was 50 quid and that went up for 50 quid plus train fare when my young person's rail card ran out. Um, and you know, and I just, I would book my life about six weeks ahead and just did a two or three years doing that. And so there was a kind of logistic momentum to it, let's say, but, um, but yeah, I just kind of did it in this way that makes me, I kind of look back and I'm, I'm kind of like, wow, <laughs> go you, 23-year-old me. Like, fuck, that's a thing. So the, the thing is with you, and I put you in the same kind of ballpark as um, Biffy Clyro, no one can ever take away from you the amount of work you've done. <laughs> so I remember back in the day when I'd buy Kerrang! magazine um, to find out about gigs because you wouldn't be on Instagram and Twitter and all this. And the Biffy Clyro page would be half of the page of their advert because they were doing 200 shows, you know, on a tour for infinity land and stuff. And I was thinking fair play to them. The reason they're headlining download now is because they put the graft in, they went and played every show they ever could. They did the shitholes with 10 people, but then now they can play arenas. And I genuinely think you've done the same. The fact that we're here and you're nearly at your 3000th show, yeah, <laughs> you don't come that far doing the shed in Leicester three thousand times. You do it yeah. because you evolve <laughs> and you want to get bigger and you want to. Well, well ho- hopefully, you know, let's say. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I thank you. That's kind of you to say. I mean, it is a funny thing that like I am sort of aware that the whole show counting thing is like. I mean, I started doing it because at the beginning it was just me, and there was yeah. there's nobody I can call and be like, "Hey, what did we do in 2006?" Because um, I mean, obviously there are people I know from Tin and being an example, but like, yeah. You know, there, there's no constancy of kind of, there's no body of people who, who did the whole thing. It was just me. Um, but I'm aware that there's, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It's just a number ticking over and there's a degree of bravado, but most of all that like quality and quantity are not interchangeable concepts. And like a few years ago, I was at the independent music awards and they gave me an award for hardest working artist, which was very nice. And then shortly afterwards, they gave me a, an award for best live act. And I was like, I'm really relieved I got the second one because it's sort of, one could be the hardest working artist and still be awful. Do you know yeah. what I mean? it's, it's at least hypothetically possible. I mean, I like to think that after this many shows that I've sort of developed some aptitude. <laughs> as, as they give you the trophy for the hardest work and they're like, you'll get there eventually, Frank, keep going. Yeah, do, you, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah there's a, like, it's, I mean, I'm, well, you know, I'm not going to look at award horse is that a thing in the mouth um but 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 uh but yeah getting the kind of the quality as well as quantity so won't quit award 2024 you know yeah right right they're like he still hasn't fucking gone away yeah. like i mean there's a part of me that thinks that that would actually be a not inappropriate thing for me to get i mean people do sort of say what's your secret and i only slightly sarcastically reply stubbornness do you know what I mean? <laughs> like... but, but isn't it amazing that you now on album 10, you're headlining 2000 trees, you're getting to play all over the world. Mm. You're, you still got, and I'm sure it's helped having a new drummer, but you've got the energy and the, the desire and the hunger that you had probably still 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It's not like you're like, Oh, I've got to do another album because I've got to pay the mortgage and I've got this legal yeah. bill. You're doing it because you want to do it. Yeah. And I'm very fortunate in that. And that's important to recognize, but I, it, it, it's funny that you put it that way because that is a thing. I, I know that there are bands and everyone does think different uh, things differently, but like there are bands who are like book studio time and then kind of write songs when they're in the studio or, or whatever. And, I never and get that. It feels like it's a waste of time. You're spending I mean, money for yeah, the sake of what, it. How much fucking money have you got? But, <laughs> yeah. Like, but secondly, that just seems like, you know, oh, it's time to do an album. We should probably do an album. Like, fuck that. Like I write songs until I feel like there's enough material to create a body of, of yeah. stuff and to 
justify spending money on being in a studio, you know? So, um, uh, I do try and check in with myself that I'm doing this for good reasons. I'm not just making records because that's what I do because I've got a mortgage to pay because, uh, you know, whatever, this is my job. This is yeah. how I make my living, but it's like, ultimately, like I could go out and do an anniversary tour of England, keep my bones, let's say, and make a pretty decent living doing that, um, at any given time. And I hope that I will choose to do that rather than just churn out a record as, and when that moment arrives do you know what i mean like um you know and and, and like and, it, and people may turn around and say well i think you are turning it out and that's totally legit but i tr i guess what i'm saying is i try and check in with myself that i'm not just sort of doing making new records for the sake of it i think it's an amazing place where you can be supporting my chemical romance then you can play 2000 trees festival you can do your own show i feel like you've got everything in place to do what you want to do and i think that's really fucking awesome to have earned that right where if when you get announced as supporting michael <laughs> romance it's like he's not fucking metal he's not heavy enough it's not that it's people are like yeah fucking great the atmosphere in manchester when i saw you was unbelievable yeah that was a cool show and like kudos frank i mean all of the my cam guys but frankie arrow is just he's you know you just occasionally encounter people and they're like good guy yeah like, one like, of the good ones you know, He's wearing a white hat in the film of this. Do you know what I mean? Like he's just a, he's going to heaven, however you want to put it. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, it's a, that, that, that is a thing. And there is a, some of my thinking about this kind of is in the record, but like, you know, at a certain point, like I, I'm aware that everything I'm about to say doesn't really matter in the broad scheme of things, but it does sort of matter in my life. And I'm the one talking, then you ask of course. me on the podcast. Like I want to know. <laughs> but, um, but like, you know, at a certain point, um, this is my 26th year as a touring musician, 20th anniversary of my solo show, album 10, all these, you know, I'm into my stats, whatever, coming up from show 3000. And it's like, ultimately, you know, that's not actually, it's, it doesn't happen all the time. And it's not actually that easy to do. And like, I remember, many years ago socially encountering somebody from a kind of i mean to make my point now kind of totally forgotten indie band who are quite buzzy at the time who just sort of made some slightly snarky comment about me and what i do not necessarily in a in a in a particularly vicious way but just in a slightly kind of like taking the piss yeah. kind of way. and it was like motherfucker if you're still playing ali pally fucking 15 years into career then let's have that conversation but in the meantime back in your fucking box do you know what i mean because i know you just fucking headline ding walls or whatever and yeah. not a the enemy but like trust me i've seen so many people like you come and go and that's me being defensive you know um uh but but you know it, this this long in album 10 it's you at a certain point you sort of become slightly inarguable like people can say they don't like what i do and they do sometimes um but uh it's kind of hard to argue that it's completely meritless in this juncture because it's sort of self-evidently isn't and and like and, and and you do sort of acquire this kind of weight you know and this i guess a right to stand your ground and like i'm, I'm you, sort you wouldn't of, be where I'm, you were you wouldn't be here now on album 10 if you didn't deserve it, if you hadn't put the graft in, if people didn't like it. It's true. It's not blowing your own trumpet. It's rightfully so. You're doing yeah, album number 10. You're doing right. it. There's, there's you know. just a little bit of kind of like sort of chest yeah, out you should. that I'm allowed to do from time to time, you know, and like, and that that's not a sort of, <laughs> I was going to say a gesture, I don't know, <laughs> that comes to me all that naturally. Do you know what I mean? But like, um, it's kind of fun, like, you know, hanging around backstage at festivals. I mean, one thing I will say, so last summer we did a, a 10 million sort of punk leaning festivals around Europe in the summer. And there is um, definitely like a new generation of punk bands around that between, and there is like clear blue water between me and them and i think that's great in lots of different ways i mean first of all because there's so many fucking great bands around right now like jen and the degenerates no bro great bands with his, uh, obgms uh, mannequin pussy do you know what i mean like, there's so many fucking cool bands coming up right now but also like it's it's a funny sort of role that i'm slightly adjusting to but like <laughs> it's, like we were in we were in Italy and this kid from a grind band, I can't even remember their name, who's was American, came over and was like, my first ever gig was you and my parents didn't see you in like 2011 or something. And I was like, oh, fucking A. And he was like, oh, you know, big fan, come and could you come and see my band? And I had nothing to do all day. I was like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I was completely shocked to discover that they were a grind band <laughs> for a start. And secondly, they were wildly popular. There was a place was rammed. And it was just like, oh, and then he wanted to have a selfie for his Instagram. And it was like, 
Yeah, sure. Like, you need to take those moments. They're, they're, right, they're you important. Know, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's like, I don't want to be a fucking elder statesman museum piece or any of those kind of <laughs> terms, terms just yet. But then to go back to what we started talking about here, it's like, it's been 20 years since, you know, or more, you know, since this has been going on. That's a long time. That's the distance between the first Beatles album and Ride the Lightning. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's time enough. Um, so, you know, I think um, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess what I'm saying is, and there is sort of parts of this in, in the new record, I'm sort of trying to find my way to sort of finding a comfortable role within yeah. the context of everything that we're talking about. Here. One of my favorite bands of all time, and uh, they, they stay deep in my heart, is Frice. Uh, I think Dustin mm. Kendrew is one of the best songwriters yeah, ever. Yeah. Uh, similar to you, he can go off and do his solo stuff and do all this stuff sure. acoustically, and it's beautiful. And then he can go on stage and sing really heavy stuff. But as you have, he's now, with the rest of the band, produced their own album, and they studio in their own studio and record everything and engineer it all. And I love the fact that you're now doing this on your own album. You haven't got a label telling you this chorus needs to be poppier. This needs to be more radio friendly. Surely it must feel like absolute freedom now for you to basically sit and say, I'm releasing this song. Actually, I don't even want to release any Mm. songs. And if I do, I'm doing this one. And I want the snare to sound like this. I want the guitar to sound like this. It must feel like a breath of fresh air. It, it does. I mean, I think it's important to say that in, you know, I did, um, I ended up doing five records licensed to Universal, which was really surprising to me because I thought we'd do one and I get told to piss off, which would have been fine. Enough now, Frank, book um, off. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And and then actually we, I finished my deal, which apparently 5% of, of people who sign a major deal complete them. So happy days. Um, but like, it's, it's, I don't want to say that I was, you know, that I ended up putting out art that I won't stand behind or anything like that, but I would have to expend a fair amount of energy kind of fighting, picking and then fighting battles. And sometimes just sort of jumping up and down and waving my arms around to try and get someone's attention, you know what I mean? Um, To make all that work. And, you know, so coming out the back end of that, yes, there's a, there's a fair degree of just like, oh, oh, (laughs) do what I want. But also, I mean, the production thing, like my lockdown project was to learn how to kind of be a producer. And I've been sort of working with other bands for a few years. And it's important to say, actually, that that was quite a big influence on the on the way the album sounds, because there's a certain point in every rock. Well, there seems to be a point in the rock musician's career when you buy a leather jacket and start complaining about how rock music has died. Uh, and it's just like, oh, fuck off. And like <laughs> working with kind of newer, younger <laughs> bands in my studio is really reinvigorating because they're full of piss and vinegar. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, I, and, that, and that's really, I think, rubbed off on me. And then we just got to a point, I also demo in a lot more depth these days. And we reached a point where I was just like, why am I going to pay somebody like a ton of money to sit in the corner and applaud me when I get it right? Do you know what I mean? It's like, I fucking know, you know, and, and I sort of effectively play the role of arranger or musical director with my band. That's not incidentally to belittle their contribution, their contributions at all. They're all, integral to the sound, brilliant players, blah, blah, blah. But like, you know, I'm sort of the MD anyway. And it's yeah. just kind of like, I didn't mix the record, which I think is important, of um, course. you know, to get an, a sort of a, a sense of distance and a more skilled mixer in on the job. But like, I, yeah, I had a good time producing. I love it, man. I think it'd be too hard to mix. I think you'd be, I think you'd turn yourself insane. I think it'd be like that you artist who can never do possibly. the last final stroke on their picture. You'd be like, I can't leave it. I can't leave it. And it'd be yeah, like, yeah, yeah, Frank, yeah, it's been 19 years since you've <laughs> released Undefeated well, that's, has never came out. You know, That's the next record, huh? Um, by the way, I hate to do this. I do have another interview coming in. And, yes, and, I'll ask two more. i got one final question. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, 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 what I do on this podcast is I ask every artist that comes on to pick the final song that's played. It can be any song, any band, any piece of music in the whole world. But as this is all edited, one song gets to play. You've probably got a million in your head. I know we've restricted yeah. the time, but what's a I song mean, that you love? Uh, where to begin? Uh, I know I'm putting um, you on the spot. Most bands are like, uh, "Fuck you," but I'm like, I mean, there's, I'm tempted. I'm tempted to be egocentric and say the last track on Undefeated, which is called Undefeated, which is a, it's not a swan song per se, but it's in a nice 330 track. episodes, only one person's chose their own music. Is that what before me or is that me? That's before you, but okay, from the right. use. Well, I said it. tempted. I said yes. tempted. I didn't say I'm actually doing it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in full disclosure. I'm, I'm reaching that point in, um, uh, in a man's life where I sort of quite often listen to my way late at night while swilling and beautiful a, a liquor and, and weeping. Um, <laughs> that's gonna be <laughs> fucking epic for the end of this. Yeah, yeah. And fuck it, let's choose that then. Yeah, my way. Yeah. There we go. 
I mean, it is genuinely, it's, it's, it's one of those songs that's so overdone and it's so cliched and it's so easy to hang kind of sort of jokey stereotypes around it. But if you actually just fucking sit down and listen yeah. to that as a piece of music, it is, it is still, there is a reason it's become a cultural stereotype, which is that it is powerful enough to sustain that level of attention. That. Amazing. I'll let you go now, but I want to record again when we've got more time because I feel like we could talk I would for enjoy hours. that. I feel like we'd scratch the surface today. Exactly. But thank you for everything. Good luck with the album and I'll drop you an email later. Thanks, man. Take thank care. Thank you. See you later. I've been pretending to be somebody else Since I was just 15 And I don't know if the show was for them or for me So there it is. There's my interview with me and Frank Turner. What an absolute awesome guy. Yes, I know the interview is too short. I'm there sitting doing the interview, having the time of my life. But with all sort of press, you get an allocated time. And we had 30 minutes. And do you know what? Even at the end, he said it. We just scratched the surface. So I'm really keen to literally have an interview with Frank again as quickly as possible. And hey, I've got something to announce. On Saturday, the 13th of July, at the best UK music festival, I will be doing a live podcast Q&A and acoustic set with Frank Turner at 2000 Trees. Yes, you heard that right. It's been announced on the Clash Finder, but we haven't actually told anyone. And it's going to be absolutely epic. Me and James, the organiser, have been planning this for a while. I'm absolutely honoured to have this moment. It's in the forest stage. It's absolutely majestic. And I'm just absolutely thrilled how intimate it's going to be. The fans are going to love it. And I'm so excited. So I'm not going to give you any more information about what's happening on that day. But get yourself to 2000 Trees this year and see me and Frank on a massive stage talking all things music. It's going to be so special. If you've listened to today's episode and you're new to Mark and Me, I do podcasts with actors, film directors, bands, musicians, songwriters, all different people from all different walks of life. And the thing is that I really pride myself on is that they're all available for free right now. So if you want to go on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Amazon Music, please dive in deep and check out some of my previous episodes. And if you're a long-time listener, thank you for coming back as always. Please, as always, everyone, share the episodes on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. All the links are on markandme.com. And as always, I do have a Patreon account. It's really tough out there right now, but if you can afford just a couple of pounds a month to say thank to these podcasts, all I do is basically put it back into the podcast and then spend that money to go and travel the country to do more interviews for you guys at home and then host it on all these different podcast networks. Also, before I go, this podcast, if you want to watch it, is now on my YouTube channel, Mark and Me TV. All you have to do is go on YouTube and type in Mark and Me Podcast and check this interview out. It's really nice. Frank's great. But some people like to listen. But I had so many people always saying they wanted to watch it. So hopefully you're happy that now I've given you that service. Now, before I go, I am going to say it one more time. Frank Turner's brand new album, Undefeated, is out right now. It came out this week. Also, the guy has just sold out in less than 24 hours his 3,000th, <laughs> even when I say it, is mad gig in London. He's headlining 2,000 Trees. My God, I'm just so proud of him. So please go and listen to Undefeated. Buy it. Let's get him high up in the charts. Give him the reward for being one of the hardest working songwriters out there. And hey, he's just awesome. I'll be back now in a couple of days time with another brand new episode. So what I want to say now is until then, everyone take care, look after yourself, listen to Frank Turner, and I'll speak to you all very soon. And now the end is near And so I face the final curtain My friend I'll say it clear 
I'll state my case Of which I'm certain I've lived A life that's full I traveled each And every highway And more Much more than this I did it my way Regrets I've had a few But then again Too few to mention I did What I had to do Saw it through Without exemption I planned Each charted course Each careful step Along the byway And more Much more than this I did it My Way Yes, there were times I'm sure you knew When I bit off More than I could chew But through it all When there was doubt I ate it up And spit it out I faced it all And I stood tall Had my fill, my share of losing, and now as tears subside, I find it all so amusing to think I did all that, and may I say. Not in a shy way Oh no Oh no, not me I did it my way For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself Then he has not To say It was 